Thank you for joining today's NIO webinar. My name is Lisa. I'm the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, and I will be today's moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. First, please locate the chat box in the bottom left corner of your screen. If you have any questions, type them in the chat box, and we will address those questions throughout the presentation. Secondly, if you have requested nursing or pharmacy and continuing education for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post-webinar email. The email will be sent out at the end of today, and all CEUs will be emailed out within the next week. Just a little disclaimer, Immunize Nevada's NIA webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization-related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. I would now like to turn it over to our speaker. Dr. Potter is a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. A graduate of Harvard Medical School and the Family Medicine Residency Program at San Francisco uh, General Hospital, Dr. Potter has divided his time between patient care, teaching, research, and advocacy for the last 20 years. We are very fortunate today to have him as he is the developer of the FluFit program. So with that, Dr. Potter, I will let you take it away. Thank you, and I, I'm hoping everyone can, can hear me, and I will just uh, launch right in. I, I, uh, it is great to be able to present to you as someone who uh, lived in Nevada during my teenage years and I went to Clark High School. I have a great love of Nevada, and it's wonderful to have an opportunity to, to share this program with you. It's also um, great to share this program with folks who are interested in um, immunization because um, I think it's I think what what that signals is that folks who are involved in um, annual influenza vaccine campaigns are ready to start thinking about ways to um, use that opportunity to reach patients uh, with other important preventive services so I am here to talk about the flu fit program which is um, a program that we developed here but now has uh, been adopted by the American Cancer Society as a program that is meant to leverage the time of annual influenza vaccine um, as an opportunity to provide colorectal cancer screening with fecal immunochemical tests, which is a take-home test for, for patients. So I'm going to um, start, um, this is just an overview, we'll start by talking a little bit about fecal immunochemical tests and colon cancer screening for those of you who are not familiar with it, and um, also <clears throat> what some of the characteristics of a high-quality uh, FIT program would be for patients, um, and then about the Food FIT program in particular, and then some examples of and resources that you could potentially use. Um, of course, one of the things about about this program is it does take some time to organize and implement, so it's not I. I unless you've already been planning to, to implement it um, starting tomorrow, which I guess is when your flu shots are, are starting, um, it might be hard to, to do a lot with it this fall, but, but you could try and, um, and certainly use this as a resource to think about it for future activities. Certainly everything that I'm going to say today is uh, relevant um, to many of your activities, I hope. So um, first of all, um, I want to start by talking about fecal immunochemical testing. Most people know a lot about colorectal cancer screening. Um, what they know about it is, is colonoscopy is, is the thing that's most popular and that it's people most frequently get in the United States, which is a test that you know involves um, a bowel preparation and uh, drinking, uh, you know, with this liquid that you take the night before and then you go in and you get sedation and have a, a somewhat invasive procedure under sedation. And if that's normal, you can get one every 10 years. Um, that is a wonderful test and um, it works very well, um, but it's not always accessible in, uh, to all patients. It's not something that every patient wants to do. And fortunately, we have other tests uh, that, that can be used that um, as, a, as a before step to before colonoscopy that can really help and uh, make colon cancer screening more acceptable. So um, that is the fecal immunochemical test. It's a stool test that is done once a year. Um, 
can. It's a single single specimen. It's inexpensive, easily obtainable. Of course, by the patient, it can be offered by any member of the healthcare team. It's something that you can give to the patient. They can do it in the privacy um, in their own home um, without any special preparation. And then they can just drop it off at the clinic or mail it into the clinic the next day. Um, it's non-invasive, as I said, it has no risk of pain, bleeding, bowel perforation, any of the adverse outcomes of colonoscopy. And then if you do the annual stool test, um, you only have to do the colonoscopy if it's abnormal. And if it is done every year and followed up correctly when abnormal, um, it is similarly effective to just, uh, you know, the, the step of just going and getting a colonoscopy. And there is a fair bit of research now saying that suggesting and indicating, I guess not surprisingly, that many patients would prefer to do this for colon cancer screening, um, and especially uh, populations that are uh, served in community health centers. Um, this is uh, often who, who are not not eager to go to another facility and have an invasive procedure in those populations and those groups uh, that is often very much preferred. So that's uh, a few words about the test itself. Um, it is really important, as I said, especially in public health settings. This is a map of states showing the colorectal cancer screening rates in states, uh, in community health centers by state. And you can see, um, this is from 2014, the state of Nevada actually has relatively low uh, screening rates in community centers, 14%. Now, you know, we have this national goal of trying to get to 80% by 2018 nationally. We'll never get there if we don't do a lot more in community health centers across the country. Um, there has been, since we've had this campaign, um, some progress. And you can see that nationally the screening rate in community health centers is creeping up from 30% in 2012 up to 38% in 2015, I'm sure there's been a similar increasing trend in Nevada, but still there is a long way to go. And again, um, making colon cancer screening more accessible to more people is the, uh, is the key here. So um, if you are going to do a fecal immunochemical testing program, either in a, a part of an organization that provides uh, flu shots um, or a community health center, you do have to do some homework, and that means you know, selecting, uh, there are many brands that say you have to select a brand uh, that is uh, evidence-based and affordable. You have to identify your patient population. You have to develop a communication strategy. How are you going to promote cancer screening? Uh, make it seem uh, like it's a good idea and, and, and how are you going to get your staff to be enthusiastic about this extra work that you're having them do? Um, you have to make sure that the patients have appropriate test instructions, especially if they've never done a test like this before, um, and then assure that when you give the kit that there's some follow-up to make sure that they complete the test, um, send it in, um, and, um, and then assure that there's a processing portion of this, that it's either, it either the test either goes to a laboratory that knows how to handle these tests or that you have staff at your clinic that's prepared and well-trained to uh, to, to develop the tests and record them. Um, and then you have to follow up. If it's abnormal, um, you need to make sure they get a colonoscopy, which is a whole additional navigation process. Because of course, screening is, does no good if you do the screening and then you find an abnormal test and you don't do the ne necessary follow-up. So the colonoscopy allows them to detect, to actually remove the polyps, for example, if that's what's being detected, or diagnose a cancer if that's the case. Uh, of why the, the blood is in the, in the, in the stool test. Um, and then you follow up the test. Uh, if they're normal, of course, you still have to remind the patient that it's time to do it again next year. And you have to have a system that, that reaches out to people. So that's a fair bit of work. Um, it's not unlike a lot of other things that we do in medicine. But it is important to realize that just like putting on a flu shot campaign, there are a lot of um, a lot of components here to do a successful fit uh, campaign as well. So, and that's why I always say, you know, before you start and just assume this is a good idea, ask yourself, you know, how, how important is colorectal cancer screening within your organization? Um, is it a priority for your, for your, for your, or for your leaders? 
Um, is there a, is there a substantial population that really needs to get screened? You know, from age 50 to 75, um, who's going to lead? And the answer is all, should almost always be yes, because colorectal cancer screening is one of the most important things we can do and easiest things we can do to save lives um, in that population. But it is important that everyone be on board and agree to that and commit to that. Who's going to lead it? Um, what are the resources that you're going to be able to commit? Um, it's, it's not expensive to do, but it does take time. And um, that time has to usually be recommitted, committed from something else unless you have extra money to, to pay, for the, pay for those efforts. Um, and then um, this issue of what can we leverage and learn from other activities that we already do well? And that's where the annual flu shot campaign is, uh, is, was the idea here um, for the flu fit. But there are other ways that you might be, other things that you might be doing that you could add the um, colorectal cancer screening to. What can you learn from those? And how do we make it easy for patients for example, if you're sending and have, having them do fit kits, um, it certainly is nice if you um, make sure that the instructions are low literacy or in the language that they speak. If you have uh, if you have a, a postage paid envelope that they can mail it back to a lab, um, that certainly or a clinic, that certainly is better than asking them to drive back in and bring it to you. Um, and how can we make it easy for the clinicians and staff as well? So that means having systems and materials ready at their fingertips and reminders. It may mean having the kit sent to the laboratory and sent up to the clinic to be developed because we know clinic, clinic teams don't really like handling these, these kits coming into their clinic. They usually prefer it to go to a laboratory. Of course, if, uh, if that's what, you, what or if they are going to going to be coming in to the clinic, have a system of figuring out who's going to do it and when and where they're all going to be uh, sitting and so forth. And then how do you make it sustainable and scalable if it works? So you may do a pilot test, a, a pilot program with a few doctors and nurse practitioners and nurses in one pot of a clinic or something like that and find that you're doing this great outreach. But you want to have something that everyone is able to do. Um, if it works, you want to have it some, be not just something that you have to, you know, you need one or two committed people to do it in one small corner of the clinic, but you, it has to be something that then everyone else can do, even if they're not quite as committed as those two, two or three initial people who try it out. So why the flu fit uh, program? Um, just to move on. Um, why try to combine flu shots with fit kits? And um, I think I've sort of already alluded to this a little bit, is that it, it is possible to implement it as part of activities that you're already doing with annual flu shots. Fit is a test that has to be done every year just like a flu shot. And uh, if you're already organized and gearing up to outreach people and send them mailers and tell them it's time for your flu shot, it's not that hard to add the message, well, when you come in for your flu shot, we could also your do give you a fit kit. And especially if you are, obviously we should be offering fit kits year round to every patient every time they come in if they're due. But if you're in a clinic that isn't really used to gearing up for talking about um, engaging with patients around colorectal cancer screening, doing it around a flu shot campaign is a good way to kind of gear up and get everyone trained and aware of colon cancer screening kind of enthusiastic. And then you can use those lessons around the, you know, for the rest of the year. Um, it, doing this type of, of project is pretty uh, inexpensive and doesn't require a lot of extra resources. And um, many people across the country have implemented successful flu fit programs without any more uh, resources than I'm going to provide you today with today and with our website. Um, and it can be used in a lot of different types of clinical settings from community health centers to large HMOs like Kaiser Permanente. Um, and there is a lot of evidence that it actually works. So those would be the reasons to consider doing it. And here's a, here's a prog flu fit program diagram. This is also on our website. Um, but uh, there are different steps. So there's a planning process where you as a, you know, decide to do it, you just figure out that everyone is going to get trained to do this. 
there's going to be a plan where you're going to figure out what you're going to do every day. Um, and then there's the tracking. And then there's the follow-up and navigation to colonoscopy as needed. Um, pretty straightforward and logical steps. And just, again, where, where you can do it. This is, these are different types of settings where we've done it. So the, on the upper left, that's San Francisco General Hospital's uh, Family Medicine Center, where, which is a hospital-based clinic, large clinic. That's where we did it the first time. Then we did it in community health centers in San Francisco. That's the upper right hand. Those are the entryways of some of those clinics. We've done it at Kaiser Permanente. Those are the big. Uh, large buildings on the lower left-hand corner, and then we've even pilot tested it at, at Walgreens uh, pharmacies. Now, um, it's a little bit different in each, each, each of these settings. So in the San Francisco General Hospital, they knew who was coming in for their annual flu shots because they would have a clinic and they had someone go through the list and see who was due, and then they had the kits ready for them when they came in. In these other, in some of the community health centers, they didn't have flu shot clinics, but they did have a system whereby a nurse would basically grab people as they walked in the door for several months of the year and give them their flu shot immediately. So they had a, developed a system whereby when, while the nurse was getting the flu shot for the patient, someone that they would also um, offer them a fit kit if needed at the same time. So it was sort of built into their protocol. And at Kaiser, um, they had this big, uh, long line of people who uh, who wait for their flu shots. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And they used their electronic health record to um, immediately know whether the person was due and hand it out at the registration desk. And then at uh, Walgreens pharmacies, this is something that we pilot tested, I think a little bit more challenging at a Walgreens pharmacy because you have to figure out how it's going to be paid for, um, who's going to be following up on the abnormal test. Pharmacists are often not used to doing that. How are you going to make sure that they get their colonoscopy if they need one? Um, but in theory, it's possible. And then we, we are aware of some uh, folks who've been working with the American Cancer Society to develop programs where pharmacies are partnering with um, local primary care and gastroenterology groups to try to coordinate these programs. I think the key, the, the thing that we've learned there is that to do this well, it's really helpful to be in an integrated system where um, you can know whether the person is due for screening and you can notify, make sure that they get the primary care follow-up um, if you hand out the kits. The next slide. So this is a picture of a line, a long line of people at Kaiser uh, waiting for a flu shot a few years ago where we first started the trying a flu fit with them and we would uh, initially we were handing out kits to people while they were in line and then they developed a system with the electronic health record which looks more like this where they're inside and they're registering and you can see the woman in the red shirt um, in the middle is handing a fit kit to someone who's due while she's registering for the for the flu shot. And at Kaiser, this has been so successful that they've, um, and they have many things that they do for colon cancer screening. They mail kits to patients, and they have people everywhere in the whole facility constantly reminding people to get colon cancer screening. And it's actually in Northern California, I believe, that the colorectal cancer screening rate has gotten close to 90%, which I think is the highest in the nation. But the flu fit program is one of the things that they use because they found that a lot of people who come to uh, Kaiser for flu shots um, don't come necessarily come in at other times of the year, so it's a good time for them at the end of the year when they're getting all their metrics together to catch up and give each person who uh, hasn't had one, hey, you're here for your flu shot, um, looks like you're due for your colon cancer screening, let me just give you this kit and you can do it, do it uh, today and mail it back tomorrow. It doesn't require a lot of a lot of instruction at that point, especially in a setting where most people at this point have done it at least once, so they're familiar with the test. And they actually have these training programs where they have people come in from the whole region and they actually practice giving flu shots and fit kits. Okay. 
So the basic algorithm is, you know, if these are types of things that can be at the desk with the staff, but, you know, the patient 50, 50 to 75, um, they have not had a colonoscopy in the last 10 years or a fit test, then you can offer them a fit test. And you may also want to add other questions about, um, and this is up to you depending on your population, um, you know, if someone has a family history of colon cancer or um, recent rectal bleeding, maybe they should talk to their doctor about getting uh, additional evaluation, like with a colonoscopy or some other type of exam. But in most uh, settings, those two questions are the critical ones. And you can either have your team ask those additional questions if you want, or you can assume that because they're in primary care and they have a primary care doctor, that those questions have already been asked uh, by the primary care doctor and are being taken care of if, uh, if, if they're important. And here's an example of uh, POSTER. So at the Family Health Center and at San Francisco General Hospital, there are five uh, fairly substantial language groups that are seen there. So we developed very simple messages um, with patients and staff, um, and uh, they were screening from the ages of 50 to 79 at that point, but 50 to 75 is really the age group that's most recommended now. Um, but, you know, yearly home stool tests are easy to do. They could save your life. You know, this whole thing about flu preventable, but so is colon cancer. A lot of people don't realize that colon cancer is actually not, it's not just about early detection, it's also about prevention, because if you find the polyps and you get them removed, that actually saves, could potentially save a life, so it's actually preventable that way. And so getting people to have that idea that it's um, preventable, could save your life if something is detected, um, important and easy messages for anyone to give. And then here's an example of, you know, sometimes the stool test instructions can be, can be challenging because they're written at a high literacy level or in English and they don't speak English. Um, there are, you can develop fit instructions um, that are wordless. Um, you can, um, there, there are also some, when we have these on the, our website, there are also um, instructions that are in different languages. Of course, it depends on what kit you're using, what instructions, uh, you, know, you need to use instructions that are relevant to the kit, to the brand of kit you're using. Um, <clears throat> so you can either, you can, but you should be able to adapt this type of thing for your own setting for the kit, type of kit that you're using if you're not using this one. So um, again, don't everyone ask about, well, how much is this going to cost? And I mean, I think it, it depends a little bit on your setting. If you're in a setting where uh, for example, all you're seeing is undocumented patients, and there's no way you're going to get reimbursed by anyone for anything. I mean, it, that that can be challenging. Um, but the main, you know, but on the other hand, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, cancer screening is uh, reimbursable, so it shouldn't cost you anything to offer screening. Um, the main uh, issues are, you know, the program materials, which are very inexpensive, the staff time. And then, of course, the follow-up colonoscopy, which, of course, also should be covered if they have uh, Medicaid. Um, but um, still, it can be challenging to um, organize, and, um, and sometimes the patient does have to bear some costs. You'll have to develop your own, your own business case um, for, for this program. Um, but if you are doing activities around colorectal cancer screening, um, this one is relatively inexpensive, probably less expensive than mailing kits to patients because the return rate on mailed kits is, can be low, um, whereas uh, you can get fair, here you're, you're, you know, having a personal contact with someone and uh, people tend to return them at higher rates when they have a personal, personal contact. Maybe you're not used spending as many kits or sending out as many kits this way, although I think both, both approaches are important. Um, here, we have some of these resources. If you go to flufit.org or flufobt.org, I think we're, we changed our URL to flufit.org um, now, um, you'll find um, our, our do-it-yourself uh, presentation and resources. It has, uh, you know, um, um, 
let me see if I can make this pointer work. No. Well, oh, there we go. So you can see green arrow, why to do it, how to do it, step up for staff training, some program materials, frequently asked questions. If you have interest in our research, you can um, look at those articles. And there's also some review articles there and, uh, and, our, and our, my contact information. In the training materials, there's uh, not just stuff about how to do the program, but stuff about um, you know links to the CDC on flu shots and link to the links to the, to the to other references and the national guidelines on colorectal cancer screening because a lot of a lot of folks find those to be uh, useful. Okay, so um, in summary, um, you know I just uh, I think it's important to summarize that flu fit programs are just one of many ways that you can kickstart or enhance your colorectal cancer screening activities. Um, and they do reinforce the message that just like a flu shot, we need to offer fit every year. Um, I remember this um, anecdote. I was working with um, someone at, at Kaiser, and she, rec she said that she had a patient coming in to see her, it was like uh, August, and said, "Oh, uh, you know, I think uh, you know. I just want to remind you about you know, say you're going to be due for a for a fit kit soon. I maybe I should give you one now." She said, "Oh, don't, no, don't. You don't have to do that. I pick it up at the time of my flu shot. So if we can get patients thinking about, um, say that was just terrific because if we can get people thinking about colon cancer screening with fit the same way they think about getting their annual flu shot." That would be a tremendous accomplishment um, to, and, a, and a tremendous contribution to uh, getting our national screening rates up to where we would like them to be. And again, the lessons that you learn from doing a flu fit program can be used to improve screening practices throughout your organization. Um, or using the flu shot as an opportunity to do other things. For example, at Kaiser also, um, they were finding in some locations that their colon cancer screening rates are so high that they're actually higher than their breast cancer screening rates, and they were starting to hand out mammogram referrals at the time of their flu shots. And then, um, and then someone else decided, well, you know, actually, uh, they were also going to make sure that women got a, um, and they actually opened up their radiology suite on the days that they were doing flu shots, so they just would send the women right over to the mammogram suite from the flu shot uh, at, on that day. And someone else decided that they were actually going to um, give people referrals for, um, for pap tests um, if they needed them during those, during those visits. The, the initial idea, their initial idea on that was that they would, they would do the pap test at the time of the flu shot, but they, they found that women didn't necessarily want to just stop everything and get a pap test at the time of the flu shot. They started, decided that was a little too intense. But, um, but, but there are lots of things that you can do. You can also use it as a time to give other shots, like a pneumococcal vaccine or a them on their tetanus vaccine and so forth. So, um, so it's, it's, and then I think just the, just the, the practice of organizing a new program is always, always helpful for any organization, you can start small and get some successes and, and everyone feels good about it. So I think, I do think that the key to success of this type of program is, you know, you do have to decide that screening is important. It has to be something you really care about. It is something where you, to be successful, you really do have to engage everyone on the team. It can't just be one person who thinks it's important and no one else does, or one person who's doing all the work and no one else has to care about it. It has to be everyone working together. Um, you do have to plan and make sure that there's time and resources to do it right. Um, and I think part of that is also giving yourself enough lead time so that you can really think through it um, before you hit the ground um, and start. Yeah, I think making it fun and creative uh, is always good. I, every every place seems to have different ideas about how to do that. Um, I don't know, having a little prize or for someone who's doing a good job or um, fun uh, graphics on a poster or a mailer. Those types of things can always um, can always be uh, be encouraging to the group. Um, again, I think having um, getting to the level of detail where you can really have a, know what's going to happen at each step 
Um, everyone is going to have, um, like any new program, there's always going to be roadblocks and mistakes. And, and in fact, you know, flu season is, can sometimes be flu activities for a clinic, outreach activities sometimes happen in a very concentrated period over a few short weeks. And a few mistakes can get in the way and really stop the flu fit program from happening sometimes. And I think that the important thing there is to just, that's okay. You know, you can try it again. You maybe won't reach your goals this year, but you can learn from those mistakes and try it again next year. And if it doesn't work then, you can try it again the year after that. As long as you think that it fits with your goals, you will eventually figure it out. Um, I remember there was one uh, clinic that we worked with that had trouble doing it for a couple years, and they couldn't quite figure out why. And um, we, we went out and visited, and it turned out, you know, it was because of the way that their flu shot line was set up that the computer was in the wrong part of the room, and the staff who were supposed to be accessing it didn't really know how to use it or know how to how to access it. So, you know, just a few things where we changed um, it so that the patient would get the fit kit before the flu shot instead of after the flu shot. That made it a lot easier because they were having trouble getting people to sit around and wait to get their fit kit after they got their flu shot. The patients coming into their flu shot just want to go. So if you set up a process where you get the, flu, the, the fit kit first, um, that makes it a lot a lot better because they're there for the flu shot primarily, but then you're saying, well, but wait a minute, before before we do that, we have to do this, and that's much better. And then they were very successful after that. Um, whatever happens, you know, celebrate your small successes. Um, uh, another site I remember, they didn't do a lot. They didn't do a ton of, um, of fit kits the first year that they tried it, but they did detect one person as a result of this thing. They detected one person who actually had cancer. And that was something to celebrate throughout the entire organization. And that really created a lot of momentum for, for continued activity. So whatever it is, if it's just you've got a few people screened or you've got a few people to be aware of the importance of this, you're gradually changing awareness in the, in the clinic, in the community, and uh, you will see your screening rates increase over time. Um, we do have a Facebook page now, so you can find us on Facebook. You can share your stories on Facebook, or you can share your stories. I, I really would love to develop a community where people are doing these programs start to share their stories. Um, um, or you can share the, your stories with us, with me, and I'd be glad to try to get them out there. Um, and then just don't give up. And I think um, those are the things that really those are the real uh, messages as far as doing a successful program. And um, again, the, um, these are some of the, some of the uh, resources, foodfit.org. Um, and um, you can also ask for help from the local American Cancer Society team because they do have teams across the country that are experienced in this program and other ways of getting colon cancer screening. Uh, rates up, and they often are willing to come out to your clinic or facility and give you free resources or technical assistance or advice, um, which is always nice if there's someone in your community who can help. And then there are other, if you're looking for other excellent online resources about colorectal cancer screening, I really recommend um, going to looking at the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtables website, which is nccrt.org. And that is a wonderful place to find information. Um, and I just uh, finally want to thank um, all of the various partners that we've had in this work over the last, uh, I can't believe it's been over 10 years that, that ago that we started doing this work. And it's been very gratifying to see so many people taking a fairly simple idea and running with it in, in many productive um, directions. And I hope that you'll be among them. And uh, with that, I think I will end my talking and um, would be glad to answer any questions. It looks like there's about 30 of you on, uh, on the webinar, so perhaps some of you have questions, and I'd be glad to try to answer them any time we have left. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Potter. Um, before we say goodbye, like he mentioned, we'd like to offer a little bit more time for last-minute questions. 
So please type those questions into the chat box now. Um, while we're waiting for those questions to be typed in, just a couple of reminders. If you have requested nursing or pharmacy continuing education credits for today's webinar, please make sure you complete the survey in the post-webinar email. And the email will be sent out at the end of today, and all CEUs will be emailed within the next week. If you'd like to view or share this webinar, the recording will be available on our website along with information for future webinars. Please visit immunizenevada.org backslash webinars for those details. All right, and we do have one question here. Um, how do you recommend um, clinics deal with the uh, quote unquote gross factor of fit tests? Yeah, how do you? Um, so, well, I think the first thing is if the staff person explaining to them it to them is gross job, that's always a turnoff. So, if, well, if you're explaining to them, you do have to smile and say, you know, this is easy, <laughs> hard. But it is actually very easy if you're using a single sample, these single sample tips. You know, you just put the little piece of paper on the top of the toilet bowl. You go to the bathroom. You poke it. A couple times, a few times, and you stick it in the little tube. There are some uh, kits that use a long-handled brush. Um, that's the Insure kit. Um, that one's also very easy. Um, and you know, when you compare it to doing the colonoscopy, um, it's a lot less uh, ick for many people. So you know, I think it has to do with the enthusiasm about saying how easy it is um, to do. Um, and believe it or not, people do it. Um, and um, we were able to, you know, a lot, in a lot of settings, we can get more than 50% or 70% uh, of people to return the kits if you do it, um, if you do, if you, if you explain it to them properly. There is a, there's another program that I've heard of that uh, you may have heard of, which sort of makes it kind of humorous. That they call it. Um, Poop on demand. Have you ever heard? Of, I don't know if you've ever heard of that program, but that there's this clinic in Florida that tries to get people to actually do it in the clinic before they leave, and then they say, "Well, you know, if you can give a sample now, you can do it right now." And they can make it kind of fun, and they have like <laughs> little bean bags in the shape of a poop emoji that they throw around the <laughs> clinic. And so there's many creative ways uh, to do it, but I think you know, humor is probably the best way. You know, and then reminding people that this could, this it may be, you know, maybe uh, gross, but this is this could save your life. You know, so yeah, uh, that was those are the, I think those are the types of messages, messages to try to give. Okay, we do have another question. Um, do you have any recommendations on the best point person uh, within a clinic to take on this project? Have you had any success or failures with a certain uh, type yeah. of uh, position? Well, it, it really depends. I mean, I think um, certainly, you know, if it's a if it's a medical facility, you know, it's important that there be that the doctors care about it because that. I mean, that's one thing. But usually, the person leading it is going to be some kind of a nurse manager or a nurse a quality improvement coordinator person, someone who supervises the medical assistants who are usually the ones who are going to be uh, handing out the kit. So some usually some sort of new nurse nurse led role or quality improvement led role um, uh, would be the best person. Someone who has good relationships with uh, medical assistants, um, is good at keeping people on task, good at keeping morale up, um, and has good organizational skills, and um, who has the time. Um, that's often uh, the biggest thing. Is it has to be someone who actually has has the time to make it happen and to actually support people and, and supervise them in the way that they need. And of course, it doesn't have to be all on one person because, you know, it may be that the supervisory person is making, who sets up the timeline and then you can assign, well, your job is to make sure to find the, the patient education materials and someone else's job is to make sure all the nursing stations have enough fit kits. Someone else's job is to be in charge of keeping a log of all the people that we've given tips to so that we can make phone call reminders. Um, so, you know, you don't, it's not all one person, but it, it's, you know, it's sort of just like any other clinic project. It's, you want the person who, gets, who can get things done and who can um, help other people to get things done. So usually doctors aren't the best people for that for some reason. <laughs> Being 
one night. <laughs> I think I know why. But, uh. <laughs> okay, well, great. Um, I don't see any other questions now. Um, do you have anything else to add? No, I well, I'm I uh, not particularly not if there's no no or not any other questions. Um, I think you know, it's, as I said, it's great to connect with your organization and to think of the to have uh, groups that are not just primary care organizations thinking about ways to um, add to the efforts to increase. Uh, colorectal cancer screening. That's absolutely wonderful, and I wish you all the best with your activities. And certainly, if questions come up along the way in any of your health centers or other settings, um, I'd be glad to try to answer them um, online. Um, yes, definitely, and that does bring up a good point. Um, everyone will have the opportunity today to take the little um, survey at the end, and if they have any questions for you, I receive them directly, and I can forward sure. them on to you. So. We can connect that way as well. Okay. okay, well, that concludes today's NIO webinar. And again, thank you, Dr. Potter, and those of you who participated today. Um, I wish everybody a happy day. All right, good luck, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.